Good morning. My name is Joe Donito, and I will be teaching an adult Sunday school on the book Essential Truths of the Christian Faith by R.C. Sproul. I'm coming to you from uh, Lutes, Florida. This is Cornerstone Presbyterian Church, and if you're looking for a church, we would love to have you. We are right off of Van Dyke and Marsh Road in Lutes, and uh, we are open. Uh, we are practicing, uh, you know, PPE. I, my, my mask is right over there. You also might notice something different this week if you've seen me before, and that is no glasses. Uh, for the first time in 50 years, I have no glasses because I had uh, cataract surgery in both eyes now with a successful uh, implant, and um, so I'm just enjoying that. Um, but uh, before we start our lesson, our lesson this week is Lesson 66, Justification by Faith, Lesson 66. Uh, let me open us in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you for Easter coming sh in just two weeks. Um, and um, uh, just continue, please, to pour out your blessings on the pastor and his family, um, who has just recently come back from Chile and is now uh, here to stay in America. The leadership, the uh, members and the regular attenders uh, of uh, Cornerstone Presbyterian Church, and this class, and let us um, uh, have, a, uh, uh, have you here in a special way as we study your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, our lesson is Lesson 66, Justification by Faith. Martin Luther declared that justification by faith alone is the article upon which the church stands or falls. In other words, this is not just like a uh, an extra doctrine or something that you you know it's, it's it's okay to have it, but it's not like essential or important. This cardinal doctrine of the Protestant Reformation was seen as the battleground for nothing less than the gospel itself. In other words, you can't give on it. You can't give in on this justification by faith alone and not by works, uh, is crucial. Justification may be defined as that act by which unjust sinners, like me, are made right in the sight of a just and holy God. In other words, how will we go to heaven you know, as sinners, and there we're going to go in the presence of God? How will that po be possible? I mean, we saw, we saw foreshadowing of this uh, in the Old Testament on earth. Uh, for example, um, when Uzzah touched the ark, you remember that? He got fried. Now, he didn't lose his salvation, but he got fried. He got killed. Why? Because you're not supposed to touch the ark, right? And only one person was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and that was the um, high priest. So, um, you know, there. so we saw that things were... Uh, special the, the mountain where uh, where the uh, the Ten Commandments were given and where God spoke to Moses and and so on these these are set, uh, are um, sacred and special and set apart things so we've seen that well then how can we how can I a sinner end up end up in heaven well that's that's the thing that Martin Luther struggled with when he was Catholic when he was a um, uh, an Augustinian friar, a monk. He, he just he just said, how am I going to do this? How am I going to be righteous and in the presence of a righteous God when I'm not? Okay, and then finally in the book of Romans, he found the answer that it's not my righteousness or your righteousness, it's an alien righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. Okay, um, so, anyway, let me continue. The supreme need of unjust persons is righteousness. We need to be righteous. Jesus says to, um, to his disciples, unless your righteousness uh, um, surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Peter and the disciples, they all look at each other and they go, wait a minute, we know what the, we know what the scribes and Pharisees are like. They're the ones who are counting 662 every day, 
right? Remember the 662 rules that the Jews had to follow um, uh, in the Old Testament? And they were making sure I make sure I did this, make sure I did that. So Jesus just said, unless your righteousness surpasses theirs, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. And of course, they say to him, well, then who can be saved? And he says, well, for man, it's impossible. You can't be saved apart from Christ. In other words, you have to receive Christ and his merit and what he did on the cross. Okay, that's what will justify you. You have to take his blessing, his holy life, his shed blood, and that comes on you. And what does Jesus do in exchange? Believe it or not, he takes our sinful life. He takes all our sins, past, present, and future, on him. And he did that once for all on the cross. Continuing. It is this lack of righteousness that is supplied by Christ on behalf of the believing sinner. Justification by faith alone means justification by the righteousness or merit of Christ alone, not by our goodness or good deeds. Okay, And there is the stumbling block. The Jews tripped over this, and so did the Catholics at, at the Reformation. The Jews tripped over this because the Jews said, oh, what are you saying? Are, we, are you saying that we shouldn't obey the commandments? No, nobody said that. Are you saying that um, we shouldn't have a holy life? We shouldn't you know, do what's right? No, nobody said that. It's just obeying commandments and doing what is right doesn't get you to heaven. Okay? What gets you to heaven is the righteousness of Christ, the alien righteousness, and that can be found in the book of Romans. Um, the issue of justification focuses on the question of merit and grace. Um, and, and the thing is, um, I mean, if we look at the church, if we look at the Reformation, um, I hope for the, hopefully I'm going to get this right now. Uh, this is should be from left to right for you. Is that right? Left to right for you? Okay. You got it. Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, and Calvin. Okay. And the point being, you can't have a Reformation without all of them. Okay? Um, Augustine, his theology dominated the Christian faith for 800 years. He was called the doctor of grace. In other words, Augustine got grace right. But Augustine and people in the 400s, 400 AD, they had many things on their table uh, uh, to deal with. They had to uh, uh, define the canon of the uh, New Testament. They had to define the Trinity. They had to come up with the creeds. I mean, there was so much. So it's not fair to say, well, why didn't Augustine come up with justification by faith alone? All right. Then what happens later, after Augustine, is we get Aquinas. And Aquinas in the 1200s wants to um, systematize theology. Uh, if you're wondering why nobody studies theology from Augustine's writings, it's because they are all over the place. The man is not organized. They're all over the place. So Aquinas comes along. And Aquinas is, instead of being a, a Platonist, in other words, somebody who follows the uh, philosophy of Plato, he decides that he's going to follow the, the uh, philosophy of, um, okay, I lost it. Um, Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle. Aristotle, there you go, okay, Aristotle. And Aristotle was completely balanced. Everything, in other words, if there was a, a plus, there was a minus, everything. And here comes the problem. is He loved uh, uh, Augustine, and he loved his theology, but just like everybody else, he knew you can't teach from it. You can't teach from those writings. They're just too strange. And so he wanted to systematize Augustine, and in so doing, he introduced the concept of merit along with grace. Now, many people, including R.C. Sproul, were Thomists, that's what they're called, people who follow Thomas Aquinas and the way he did theology. 
and, um, and you could say they were also Aristotelians. They liked everything in balance and whatever. Well, here's the problem, though. In trying to balance what Augustine said about grace, he had to introduce merit, and in doing so, after his death, which he only, he only lived 50 years, after his death, the church took his ideas and went in a different direction. And merit became earning your way to heaven. And merit became the treasury of merit. And merit became indulgences and works and so on. And it took about 200 years and the Catholic Church ended up taking us in the wrong direction. Also, you have to be very careful in teaching Aquinas, because if you teach Aquinas wrong, you would end up saying that Aquinas believed that works save you, and that's not true. He also believed you can't do good works apart from Christ. In, in other words, in his seminal work, the Summa Theologica, which I read in English, I couldn't do the Latin, but I read it in English, as this massive work about um, uh, theology, he asks this question, is it possible to do good works apart from Christ? And the answer is no. That means the only way to do good works is through Christ, or Christ is actually acting through you. So that's why Sproul can defend, uh, or could when he was alive, he could defend Aquinas, and he even did an entire issue of Table Talk saying that Thomas Aquinas was a Protestant, <laughs> not a Catholic. Okay, um, but anyway, uh, so, so the idea is merit comes in, and that becomes difficult. Justification by faith means that the works we do are not good enough to merit justification. We can't earn our way to heaven. You just can't. As Paul puts it, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. His is capital H for those of you at home, and maybe you don't have a book. This is Romans 3.20. Justification is forensic. That is, we are declared, counted, and are reckoned to be righteous when God imputes the righteousness of Christ to our account. The necessary condition for this is faith. So by faith, you're saved. Okay, And you're saved by faith alone, by Christ alone. Um, so I'm saved... By grace through faith alone, faith in Christ alone, and his saving work on the cross. Well, what's the argument then? What, what's, what's the problem? Why did we have a Protestant Reformation? Why couldn't we work it out as a Catholic? Well, Catholics don't teach imputation. Catholics teach infusion. Okay? What that means is that God actually makes you righteous. He comes in and makes you righteous. So that, yeah, if you die, you go straight to heaven because you are holy. There's only one thing, is that the Catholics, like everyone else, hopefully, everyone else, realizes that if you're staying alive in this world, you're going to be sinning. Okay? So how do you explain, as a theologian, and, and in one way or another, we're all theologians. If you're a Christian, you're a theologian. Even if your theology only affects you. Um, although if you're a parent, it affects your kids, too. Um, but So the question is then, well, how, how do you... Well, the Catholic Church said, oh, you could lose your salvation. That's, that's the answer. So you can, you can be saved one minute and lose it the next. Now, here's an interesting thing. Remember I told you that Augustine's theology dominated the Christian Church, both East and West, for 800 years? Okay? Augustine believed you couldn't lose your salvation. In, in, in different ways, this is what Augustine said. He said, once you're baptized, okay, if it's, if it's a real baptism and if you truly believe, right, once you're baptized, it's like the Holy Spirit puts his seal on you. And you're his. There's no turning back. There's no walking away. Nothing. Okay? Well, what Catholic Church do with that? Well, like anything else, you ignore the verses or you ignore the, the writings that you don't agree with. What about Thomas Aquinas? Also, Thomas Aquinas believed 
you couldn't lose your salvation. But somehow, after Aquinas' death, the church said, this isn't good telling people they can't lose their salvation. We need to put the fear of God in them and tell them, you better not sin, because if you sin, you're going to lose your salvation. Now you might say, well, what do Protestants say if they, if they don't say that? Well, what we say is there will be consequences for your sin. But you don't lose your salvation because of it. Okay? Unless, of course, you never were saved in the first place. And that is that is a possibility. It is possible. You're just going through the motions for whatever reason. So there's this tension. And, you know, I can't paint it any other way. I was raised Catholic. I was Catholic for 34 years. I can tell you that there's this tension. What is the tension? Saved by faith alone. Saved by faith and works. Okay? So in other words, we are adding, or the, the Catholics believe you have to add to the work of Christ on the cross. And we as Protestants believe the work of Christ on the cross is sufficient. I don't add anything to it. Now that doesn't mean we don't believe in works. That doesn't mean that you know, you shouldn't live a holy life. That doesn't mean we're saying, go ahead and sin all you want. We are not saying that. And Paul himself addresses this, because Paul was accused of it. Paul was accused of saying, oh, you know, sin all you want, because every time you sin, you'll be covered by the blood. You'll be covered by grace. And Paul says, um, in no way is that what we are saying. Um, oh, there's a better... A better is for it. Um, God forbid. That's it. God forbid that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Okay. Protestant theology affirms that faith is the instrumental cause of justification in that faith is the means by which the merits of Christ on the cross are appropriated to us. So actually, you know, there's a, there's a book out there called Roman Catholicism. It was written by several prominent Protestants. And what it does is in a series of articles, it goes through and says, um, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between Protestants and Catholics? And, and at one point, they boil it all down to this. How do I appropriate Christ's death on the cross, his death and resurrection? How do I appropriate that? I can. The Protestants say by faith alone, and the Catholics say by faith and works. And by the way, you can find that in writing in any of the Catholic uh, documents that are um, official. Uh, in, in other words, I'm not making this up that they believe in faith plus works. They believe faith plus works equals salvation. We do not believe that. We believe that faith produces salvation plus works. Okay? So there will be fruit. In fact, Martin Luther was probably the first one to say it. I want to see fruit. And uh, copying Luther, um, uh, Sproul used to say it all the time. You tell me last week you got saved, I want to see fruit. I'm not pounding on the podium because there's a microphone, but I would be pounding if I could. Okay. I want to see fruit. I want to see that you started going to church. I want to see that you're reading the Bible. I want to see that you realize, ooh, stealing is wrong. And I better not cheat on my taxes, and I better not this, and I better not that. You know, there was something a lot of people did when I was in college, and um, it was against the phone company. Now, when I was in college, the phone company was a monolith, Ma Bell. Okay, there was only one phone company. There was no other phone company in the United States. And um, what people used to do is say, "Oh, you know, they, they're they got billions of dollars. No one cares." So what they used to do is they would um, they would call their parents collect and make a person to person call to some weird name like you know Jerome uh, Kern or something like that and then then the, the parent was supposed to say oh no he's not here and that would terminate the call and it didn't there was no charge and then the parent would call the student directly see and of course. They didn't see that as stealing because it was against Ma Bell, which is this huge monolithic company, and it was the only game in town. And so when you have a company like that, it's very easy 
to do that. But that's stealing. And eventually, if you're a Christian, you're going to realize that that is stealing. And then you're not supposed to steal. Why not? Because it will send you to hell? No, but because it's not pleasing to God. God saved you. He saved me. He wants us to obey the Ten Commandments. He does want us to live a holy life, but not to be saved. Now, I, I want to be really clear on this. Um, let me pick uh, Larry. Larry's in the back here. Okay. Let's say that um, I want to do something for Larry. And I, I say to him, Larry, I'd like to wash your car. And of course he says, oh, you don't have to do that. And I, and I say, no, 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 I, I really, I want to wash your car. Now, if I wash Larry's car because of our relationship or because I like him or, or we have a, a friendship, that's fine. Now, what's the difference? What if I'm washing his car to get him to like me? You see the difference now? Now, my whole reason for doing this deed or act is to try to get his support or to try to get his friendship. I'm trying to earn his friendship. You don't earn a friendship. You're either going to have it or, you, or you're not. And like I was told when I was a kid, you'd be lucky if you have five friends or if you could count on your hand all the friends, true friends, that you actually have in your life. I don't mean acquaintances. I mean real friends. Okay, so what am I saying? What I'm saying is my motivation is at stake. Now, Larry can't know my motivation, and neither can Sharon or anybody else. They can't know, but God knows my motivation. God knows whether I'm trying to... Um, well, you know, some people do it with gifts. They give gifts. It's like, oh, here, you know, I, I bought this for you. I was thinking of you. Why are they buying me a gift? Okay, well, you're not supposed to question a gift. That's true. But by the same token, you might say, well... Are they trying to manipulate me? Are they trying to garner my favor? What was the purpose? What was the reason? Okay? And of course, the reason could be perfectly fine, but, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that's the difference. We don't do good works because we're trying to get God to save us. We do good works because he already saved us. And we're showing gratitude we know what he what he wants. Uh, there's a, a famous book by oh I can't he's an Old Testament scholar who used to teach at RTS. I can't remember his Bruce Bruce um, yeah that's it. And and he wrote a book called um, Finding the Will of God in Your Life. And then with a question mark a pagan notion. And and what he basically says is there's a lot of Christians today who are always trying to find the will of God in their life and it's like. Why? The Bible tells you what the will is. He wants you to obey the commandments. If you love me, Jesus says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my Father will love you, and we will send you another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So is he asking us to obey? Yes, but is he asking us to obey to get to heaven? No, he's not. If it's our obedience, then we're no different than the Jews or legalistic Catholics or any other group. We are, we are basically saying, oh, we have to do this, 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 this. Let me tell you, the devil has many religions out there, and almost every religion, you do this to get heaven, or you do this to get reward. You have to do this. And believe me, there's a list. There is a list. They will give you a list, whether it's, a, it's an actual physical list or whether it's verbalized to you and you learn it as you go. The fact is there's going to be a list. All right. And, and uh, some Protestants are guilty of this, too. I mean, when I lived in New York and I was Catholic, a lot of Baptists that were in New York, and I don't know which stripe of Baptist. As a Catholic, I thought they were all the same. I don't know which stripe of Baptist, but they were telling me women can't wear makeup, women can't wear jewelry, women can't wear pants, no TV in the house, no cards, etc., etc. And stupid me, I thought, wow, that must all be in the Bible. Because I wasn't reading the Bible as a Catholic, and they were. They were always telling me that they were reading the Bible. It's like, well, that must all be in the Bible, right? No, 
no TV and no dancing and all this other stuff. Well, it's all legalism. That's, that's what it is. Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, Roman Catholic theology teaches that baptism is the primary instrumental cause of justification and that the sacrament of penance is the secondary cause or the secondary restorative cause. Roman Catholic theology views penance as the second plank of justification for those who have made shipwreck of their souls. Those who have lost the grace of justification by committing a mortal sin. Okay, Because the Catholic Church is teaches that there's mortal sins and venial sins and so on and mortal sins are serious and if you commit a mortal sin you, you lose your salvation and then you have to get it back by going to confession and this is the way it was taught um, the sacrament of penance requires works of uh, satisfaction by which human beings achieve congruous merit for justification the Roman Catholic view affirms that justification is by faith Okay, so you can't say that the Catholic Church doesn't believe in faith. They do. It's just to faith they add your works. Okay, but denies that it is by faith alone. Adding good works as a necessary condition. So you don't do good works, then you're going to hell. Okay, not good. Um, if I, there's one thing I learned from the PCA, it is that you can't in any way, shape, or form um, affirm or teach works righteousness or justification by works. In other words, by my works, I am going to go to heaven. No. The faith that justifies is a living faith, not an empty profession of faith. So for those who might attack Protestants by saying, ah, oh, you prayed a prayer, right? Big deal. The sinner's prayer, there's probably 150 sinner's prayers on the internet. Some of them have all the essential elements, which are that you have to admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior, and you have to ask Jesus to come into your heart as your Savior and Lord. Okay? And there's some kind of wording somebody uses. Well, a Catholic might look at that and say, oh, so you, said you prayed a prayer, and I didn't. It's a big deal. Okay? No, that's not what saves you praying the prayer. But we do believe in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Which to me is the shortest salvation formula in the Bible. Romans 10, 9, and 10. I believe that's the shortest one. Okay. Faith is a personal trust that clings to Christ alone for salvation. So I, if somebody were to ask me if I was to die tonight, would I go to heaven? I would say yes. Now they might say I was very arrogant for saying that. Okay? And then when I got to heaven, if Christ confronted me, or St. Peter, or whoever you want to say, at the gate, confronted me and said, why should God let you into his heaven? There's only one answer. Because Jesus is my Savior. Not because I'm a good person. Not because I never killed anybody. Not because I led a good life. Not because I read my Bible every day. Or I contributed to the church. Those are all good things. Nobody's saying those are bad things. But that doesn't get you into heaven. If that got you into heaven, then God and Jesus made a big mistake. Because Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. Or when Jesus came, he could have just said to us, um, you know what you should do? <laughs> you should um, lead a good life. Try to obey the commandments. That's what you should do. Is that what Jesus taught us? No. He taught us so much more than that. Right? Saving faith is also a penitent faith that embraces Christ as both Savior and Lord. The Bible says that we are not justified by our own good works but by what is added to us by faith, namely the righteousness of Christ. In a synthesis, something new is added to something basic. Our justification is a synthesis because we have the righteousness of Christ added to us. Our justification is by imputation. God transfers to us the faith, 
the righteousness of Christ. That's the alien righteousness. This is not a legal fiction, as Catholics call the Protestants in the Protestant Reformation, because God ascribes to us the real merit of Christ to whom we now belong. It is a real imputation. And the summary of the lesson, justification is an act of God whereby he declares unjust sinners to be just after he has imputed to them the righteousness of Christ. No one can earn justification by good works. Faith is the necessary condition to receive the imputation of the merits of Christ. Justification requires a living and real faith, not a mere profession of faith. And I'd like to close with um, three verses that were quoted to me many, many, many times by people who wanted me to be saved. And this is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Lord, thank you so much for this lesson, and thank you for reaching out